Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Please be seated, church family. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bible to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'll be starting in verse 13 this morning. We're continuing a sermon series entitled Speak Life. I shared with you at the beginning of the series that, that I was very much inspired by the text that we've been uh, teaching and learning from about six weeks ago, uh, excuse me, about six months ago. And in June of last year, a family was going through an incredibly difficult, as a matter of fact, one of the most difficult things a person can face in life. And so often in ministry, I'm tasked with walking through seasons of life with individuals that are absolutely in the middle of an overwhelming situation. This situation was so overwhelming that I, I myself started to feel overwhelmed. And I opened the Word of God and I began to read in 1 Thessalonians, knowing what the text said, but searching for inspiration my own self. I got to 1 Thessalonians 4 and read the verses that we'll be learning from today. And in the moment that I read these verses, I felt a wave of hope wash over me. I felt a wave of peace wash over me. And with that hope and peace came confidence, motivation, and strength. I thought to myself in that moment, the words I'm reading aren't just for the family that I'm serving. They're not just for the family I'm walking with in this difficult season. These words are words intended to encourage me. There's a family in our midst who was blessed to know and love and live alongside a person that absolutely fell in love with Jesus Christ. And the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the word, the story about Jesus provided this individual with such transformation and hope that she simply could not help but share this message of hope and love and transformation with everyone she came in contact with. I don't want to have a memorial before a memorial, but I would be remiss not to mention Jan Dasher this morning. Jan's life was transformed by the words of life, which are the words of the story of Jesus, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel changed Jan's entire reality. And because her reality had been changed, she wanted the reality of the people she loved to be transformed, their lives, their hearts. She wanted them to be reborn. The story goes, she asked an elder at this church, Bill Smith, to visit her brother, Phil Robertson, and asked Bill to share the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus with Phil. Through Jan's ministry, ladies and gentlemen, Phil Robertson responded to the gospel in baptism. His life was transformed, and because of his transformation, literally millions of people have heard the good news of Jesus. What that means is millions of people have hope. As I've reflected on Jan's life and ministry, I couldn't help but think of the hope she had in Jesus and the hope you and I also have in Jesus. I've been moved at the difference words can really make in life. Words can bring life into any dark and desperate situation, and that is God's desire for you to bring new life into your spiritually dead life, to speak life into your deepest and darkest moments, to speak life to your tragedies and struggles. This particular sermon series and the lesson today is a testimony of the plan of God. We plan to speak this particular message of hope on this particular day nine weeks ago. Hope was scheduled for this exact weekend nine weeks ago. Nine weeks ago, God knew that his people would need to be reminded. And certainly Jan would want her church family her immediate family and her extended family to remember that we all have hope 
in Jesus. Today, the Lord will speak life to you if you'll open your heart. He'll speak life into your situation through the message of hope we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I want to start with the 13th verse. I'd like you to follow along with me. If you've got our church app, there's an outline in your app that will allow you to follow along. And in the 13th verse of 1 Thessalonians 4, the Apostle Paul is addressing a persecuted church full of immature Christians who are in the middle of a trial in life. And for this particular group of people, what we learn in the text is that this group has recently lost someone from among their number that they dearly and desperately loved. And Paul wants to speak into that pain. He wants to speak life into their struggle. He wants to speak life into their darkness. And he begins the life-speaking process by saying this. Brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind, here's this statement, who have no hope. Now Paul is addressing members of a church. These brothers and sisters were already in Christ Jesus. And for hope to reign in your life, for hope to transform your reality, you have to be a member of the kingdom of God. You have to obey the gospel. You have to be born again. And for those who are born again, for those whose lives have been transformed by Christ, what they find is that in Christ, they have hope. Christ radically transforms the reality of every person who obeys the gospel and is born again. In Christ, there is no life without purpose. In Christ, there is no pain without healing. In Christ, there is no death. There is only sleep. In Christ, there is no grief without hope. And without Christ, life is purposeless. Pain is permanent. There's no hope in the midst of grief and sorrow becomes a mantle that must be carried. Now that's not to say for those in Christ who have hope that in life there will be an absence of grief. That's not what the Bible is teaching us here. What the Bible does say is those who are in Christ Jesus, the story does not stop with grief. Hope is not the absence of grief. For those in Christ Jesus, hope is simply a confidence of relief for the pain that we feel. Paul points out that grief for the Christian is not like grief for the rest of mankind. But mankind will experience grief in life because grief is the counterpart to love. If you really consider it, we feel grief and sorrow in life because we are beings made in the image of God designed to love God, and to love others. And in life, we develop relationships, and we get connected with people, and and we grow to love people more and more deeply and more and more profoundly. And when the object of our love is removed from earth, we can't help but feel a sorrow and a grief in the absence of our beloved. This is why Jesus weeps at the death of Lazarus in John chapter 11. John chapter 11 verse 35 says plainly that Jesus wept. If you know the context of the verse, there's a man named Lazarus who is died. And he's been in the tomb for four days and his sisters Mary and Martha are grieving. And because Jesus loved Lazarus so much... And because Lazarus, his beloved, was no longer present in his earthly body, Jesus felt sorrow. Jesus felt grief. And he felt sorrow and grief that was so overwhelming, he actually wept in the absence of the object of his love. Jesus knew the outcome of the situation. Jesus knew that this was not the end of the story of Lazarus 
yet he still wept. To love is to grieve. I want to remind you, church family, that it is worth the pain of sorrow and grief you'll experience in life if that's the cost of true love. Sorrow is certainly felt in the wake of the absence of the loved one, but in Christ Jesus, grief is not the end of the story. Grief is simply the moment we become confident in relief from the pain we experience in the absence of our loved one. Grief marks, for those in Christ Jesus, the beginning of a new chapter, not the end. In 1 Thessalonians 4, the apostle Paul goes on to speak that truth into the Thessalonian Christians. He says, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Now, this is an interesting text. If you'd look at the original language, the Bible's teaching us here that those who have fallen asleep in Jesus are doing just that. They're resting for a while. And those who have fallen asleep in Jesus while they're resting, according to 1 Thessalonians 4.14, have actually been brought by God with Jesus into his presence. Those in Christ who have died are actually present with Christ at this moment, according to 1 Thessalonians 4.14. And, and this phrase is used repetitively that those who have died are actually just sleeping. It's a euphemism Paul uses to describe death for the Christian three times before he actually mentions the phrase death in verse 16. This teaching helps us understand the truth that in Jesus Christ, ladies and gentlemen, we find true life. In Jesus Christ, we find real life. In John chapter 1, John describes that Jesus is the source of life. And that life is the light of all mankind. And it shines into darkness. And darkness will never and can never and has never overcome this light. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, I have come so that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Every human being on the planet, ladies and gentlemen, deals with two unsolvable problems that you alone can never solve. The, the first unsolvable problem you're going to face in life is the problem of sin, and sin is the opposite of life. It will destroy your life. It will imprison your life. It will overwhelm your life. And it will destroy everything you care about. And the second problem we face in life that's not solvable on our own is the problem of death. The good news is we don't have to solve these problems because the Lord Jesus Christ already has. Jesus is the problem solver. Jesus is the pain healer. Jesus is the conquering king. Jesus is the savior of the world and the bringer of hope even into the midst of the most hopeless of situations. Even death itself answers in obedience to the voice of Jesus. Sin is taken care of for us at the cross. And our second problem, death, is taken care of through the resurrection of Jesus. And it's death that's the focus of our text in John 11. Jesus arrives to the tomb where Lazarus, who was sick, has been buried for four days. And Jesus teaches Martha, Lazarus' sister, a lesson that we need to bear in mind today. Jesus says while they're speaking that he is the resurrection and the life. He says that the one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in Jesus will never die. Jesus deals with both of those problems in this text. He says if you believe in me even though you die, 
you will live. Jesus defeats death, and in him, in Christ, there is no death. There is only life, sleep, and life everlasting, and the one who believes in Jesus will live. The one who believes will be resurrected. The one who believes will simply rest in sleep. The resurrection solves the death problem because resurrection puts Jesus in power over death as the resurrected, immortal, and eternal king of kings. In Jesus, literally, dead things and death itself is brought to life. The second statement Jesus makes, whoever lives by believing, I've got that highlighted and underlined in my Bible. What a way to live. What a way to live by believing in something that changes everything. What a way to live by believing that we have victory no matter our situation, that we have life true life and that we can live fully alive this side of heaven. We can live an abundant life. This resolves our sin problem, our problem of destruction, our problem of misery, our problem of being captivated and imprisoned by sin. In this life, in life this side of heaven, the one who lives by believing in Jesus gets a real and true and purposeful and meaningful life. But this side of heaven, isn't it easy to live by something other than believing in Jesus? I share with our church often, if you're a visitor, that we exist in a realm where there's a very real spiritual battle taking place. And part of that spiritual battle, we fight against the enemy, Satan, who is a liar and the father of lies. And some of us live by believing the lies of the enemy. It's hard not to get caught up in that kind of lifestyle. Some live by believing in idols, the idol of materialism or the idol of pleasure or the idol of power. Some live by believing in self. And the end result of living by believing in these things is hopelessness, a life lived without hope. But those who live by believing in Jesus find hope and life and purpose. And for those who respond to the faith they have in the gospel through baptism will not only live fully alive this side of heaven, but get to live eternally with Jesus on the other side. And one day those who have fallen asleep, ladies and gentlemen, will be glorified. I want to go back to 1 Thessalonians and finish out the last section of this text. 1 Thessalonians 4.15, the Bible goes on to say that according to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That's the first time we've heard the word dead. And after that, we who are still alive and left will be caught up together in the clouds with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. That's the end of our story. That's the way it ends. There's no question mark. There's no doubt. There there should be no fear. There should only be hope because in the end, all those who are in Jesus Christ have victory. In Christ, your victory is guaranteed. In Christ, you have hope. In Christ, you can find life. And in Christ, you can be confident of victory no matter the situation you find yourself in. I like that first phrase in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 15, that it's the Lord himself who's coming down from heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is a personal Savior. 
He's interested in you having a relationship with him. And he wants a relationship with you. And one day, Jesus personally will come back to claim all those who are in Christ as his own. And this has been God's plan since the very beginning. I want you to write down Exodus 3, verses 7 through 8. I'm going to paraphrase briefly. God tells his people who are in captivity under Pharaoh in Egypt that he has seen their misery, he has heard their cry, he is concerned about their suffering, so he is coming down from heaven to rescue them. And when God says it, he means it, and you can believe it. God always keeps his word, and God's promises are true. And when God says he is coming for you, when the Bible says Jesus is coming down to rescue you, we can be confident that our story ends in victory guaranteed. Hallelujah. The dead in Christ will rise first at the return of our Lord. Can you imagine bodies literally coming out of the grave? Loved ones who have gone before us are coming out of the grave. The church of Christ is literally coming out of the grave. Those who have died in Christ are going to raise first. And I don't know about you, but I have a reoccurring dream that I can fly. Now, don't play like you hadn't had that dream. <laughs> and in the state of Louisiana, that dream has turned into a nightmare because I usually have it during duck season. I'm worried I'm going to get <laughs> shot flying around this area. Friends, there's coming a day when you are going to fly. When you are going to fly and you are going to have the most blessed reunion you can possibly imagine. The first group of people you're going to meet are all your loved ones, all your friends, all your extended network of forever family who have labored and, and, and worked and strived to bring glory to God by fulfilling their mission here on earth and have had to stay faithful through sorrow and surgery and struggle and tragedy. There's going to be a reunion of people that love God and loved one another. And then, and then the most blessed reunion of all takes place. We're meeting the one and only King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, and we're going to meet him face to face. Kirsten's grandfather is a preacher in Kansas. He's a mentor of mine, one of the men I, I respect the most in life. And he always sings this song. I want to recite it for you. You'll know it. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look, can you imagine that, upon his face, the one who saved broken, messed up, beat up, worthless, no good me, by his grace. And he's going to reach out in love and take the hand and lead me to the promised land. <laughs> what, a, what a day that will be. Hallelujah. In Christ, ladies and gentlemen, there is victory. And that is what we hope for. That's our victory. The storms in life, they might not calm. The mountains, they might not move. And I promise you, the battle won't stop. But victory is found in the Lord. Not even death itself can withstand the mighty power of our God. In John 11, the story of Lazarus continues by pointing out this fact. Verses 43 and 44, after this conversation takes place, Jesus calls out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. 
And Jesus says to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Friends, when Jesus returns, he is going to call his people out of the tomb. And he is going to call his people to be set free of their grave clothes. Their bodies will be glorified. They will be resurrected. And they will have fellowship in eternity with him face to face. And our text wraps up today with some words of encouragement. 1 Thessalonians 4.18, God wants you to encourage one another with these words. In the midst of your struggle, in the midst of your battle, be encouraged. What we've learned today, when that takes root in our heart, literally transforms our reality. Jesus changes everything. He transforms our lives. We get fitted with the purpose and we get victory guaranteed. And when we get all of that, how can we keep our mouths shut? How can we not spread the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus? That's why we live on mission here at WFR Church. That's why we buy into One Kingdom Sunday so that we can spread that good news to a lost and dying world. Some of you out there are not in Christ Jesus, and you don't have hope, and you are lost and spiritually dead and physically dying. And Jesus wants you to know today that you can leave this place with hope. I'm going to close our service in prayer, and while I pray, I challenge you to bring any need in your life forward. If you need to be born again so that you can live in hope, today is that day. If you're carrying a heavy burden and you're fatigued and you feel beat up, let our church encourage and pray for you. And if there's anything else going on in your life, we want this moment to be a moment where hope is restored and you begin living in the victory that is guaranteed. Let's bow. Precious Heavenly Father, we come forward this morning awestruck and overwhelmed at the resurrection. God, in in the Lord Jesus Christ, we find hope no matter the situation. In the Lord Jesus Christ, we find life, life with purpose, life with healing, life with hope. And no matter what the storms of life cause, no matter what the struggles in life cause, bring to our lives. God, in Jesus, we find victory. I ask you to bless this church, bless our visitors, and strengthen those who need to respond today to respond. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with me while we sing.